still so true that nine times out of ten, the person who's really helping to create that shift mm -hmm. in an agency or in a community is a member of the community. You know, we're still doing it for ourselves, even when we're doing it, you know, within professional roles, you know, or within um, agencies that we belong to. You know, it, it, it's often the queer people who are the ones saying, we need this, or we need to bring this in, or we need to focus on this. It, you know, it's, it's, it's just the way it, it seems to be. A classic example of that is the list of the Rainbow Health Network. Right, where there's a lot of queer identified health practitioners, or social service practitioners who are sharing information with each other around what they're creating, what they're yeah. doing in their yeah. own yeah. areas, in their own yeah. frontline work. So it's true, it's almost mm -hmm. like activism by infiltration. Like yeah. you're, you're in there and you're going to change things yes. from, from a queer perspective. Yes. Um, and I'm also hearing in terms of setting up services, that what comes back to me is, is, is this eventually going to become a heavier duty issue of funding? When you're talking about expansion of services or new services, is that what we're going to eventually find ourselves getting into that you're dealing with the provincial government? And can you provide funds across the province? Richard has the answer. <laughs> you too. <laughs> Our new minister of health. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I was just thinking anytime mm -hmm. I travel, I always look for a rainbow flag, you know, and you know you can go there more comfortably. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking of the legislation that's been coming through with more rights for trans people, more rights. It's, maybe it's getting to the point where we can say the government should say, if you want to be licensed to treat people, you have to be able to treat these people, and you have to have these rainbows. And then, if they think, oh my God, you know, I don't even know what to do. How do I get the help? You might, you might be getting a rainbow. Yes. Mm -hmm. No way do I want the rainbows to be legislated on to people because you don't know who's putting it there because they have to <laughs> and who genuinely gets it. Yeah, yeah. Such a good point, and it's what Anna said too. It's not about, because you could be asking every agency, hey, are you up to be positive? They're going to say yes. It's about asking the right question, which you have. Mm -hmm. how, how are you positive? And what's your policy? And what? Because I could go to a doctor and be like, yeah, I'm gay positive, and then just to say it, just to be politically correct, and like you're pointing out, that's actually a dangerous notion because we don't have that opportunity until we're there and we're vulnerable. So, uh, Martin, did you have someone online with a comment or? Uh, what's the question? Oh, your question. Okay. Um, what is the relationship between Rainbow Health Ontario and health organizations, community-based health organizations across Ontario? Do you have contact with them to get information on what's going on in the community? Which kind of health organizations? Just community-based organizations for this kind of health and health centers. Um, yeah, well, we often we often um, get connected to local organizations through our outreach workers. So our outreach workers are the people who tend to know what's going on in their area. So they'll know kind of who's you know who's ready or who's already doing stuff, and they will often then facilitate meetings so that our coordinators can often go out and then have maybe a series of meetings with people in a location, talk about the kind of stuff we're doing, and then from there it will often lead to maybe you know a partnership to do something or um, a training or, or some other project. The other thing, just to go back to what we were saying before, is I think one of the key places that we have to get um, connected is with the LINs. So the local health integration <coughs> networks are these bodies now that have taken over really from the ministry in organizing health in each of the regions. And for quite a while we've been trying to get closer or more, you know, connected to the people in the LIN. So they'll they're like an administrative planning they plan and fund most of the health services. So if you want to get, for example, to use your example, if you want to make sure that perhaps the addiction services are being mandated to serve a particular population, you've got to get the ear of people in the lens, you've got to convince them that this is a pressing need or a gap, and then you've got and then they in turn, you know, can have some leverage over over these organizations. That's something I think that actually should be legislated, uh, that the government should legislate that. 
Because they actually save money. Um, yeah. They don't cost more yeah. they because people are in treatment for less time. Uh, the fewer, fewer relapses uh, back to work sooner. Um, the impact is faster. Um, so they save money in, in, in the long run. Um, I know there's enough time for us to I think this is a place where organized groups can in fact ask for meetings with Berlin's. Um, some of them have been a little pro more proactive, so there are two or three that have actually you know, reached out to us and said, we would like to have a consultation session or a town hall with, your, with the local LGBT group. We have no idea who they are, where they are, how to find them, what to do. They really have no clue. <laughs> so, we say, fine, you know, we, we'll be able to help you, you know, reach out to, to these communities. We'll help you, you know, write the, you know, the prom promotion material so that you get the words right. We'll help you to figure out what the questions should be. And we'll be there when you have the session, if you like, so that, you know, we can make sure that the right things get asked and people have the right opportunities to say what they need. And there have been a few times when we have done that. Um, just recently, the Toronto Lynn has come to us and said they want to work on developing a tool, it's a kind of consultation tool that they want to then make as a model that would go out to the other lens for working with LGBT people. But I'm just hoping it doesn't take two or three years to get it together. Uh, would it be possible for the sake of showing the uh, pervasiveness and, and the severity of the the lack of um, LGBTQ knowledge in healthcare, um, reading a survey of people's experiences with substandard or mistreatment from doctors, maybe? Mm -hmm. So you get a sense of what exactly these things are, and you can get a sense of what effects it's had on people and on their lives, probably. Well, I'm going to turn this back to, to, <laughs> to, to Nick because <laughs> you should talk about the the study in 1995. Yes, in 1995. It was 97 that came out. That's why yeah. I'm bringing here because it's almost like returning to that. Yeah. And it would be fascinating to go back yeah. after all these years, uh, 15 years ago now. And that that study, it was our predecessor group, the Coalition for Lesbian Gay Rights in Ontario, who put that in place, Project Affirmation. That spurred Rainbow Health Network forming, which then spurred Rainbow Health Ontario forming. And, and, and that report came up with 79 recommendations. Um, which was the state of LGBT people across the province in the 90s when we did that survey. Uh, 15 years later, it, would, it may be interesting to, to look at where people are at now. Um, you know, whether we're getting adequate medical services and so on. Were there questions about that in, in terms of current Transpulse? Yes. Yeah. Transpulse did, um, tra Transpulse had 180 questions. And it's somewhere in there it covered. <laughs> and yeah. it covered many, many things. It asked a lot of questions about people's experiences with the healthcare system, as well as their own experiences of health issues. And it actually, I think, is, is you know, a, a very useful study. We're still, there's so much data that it's actually taking years to plow through it and do stuff with it. But there are a lot of really good little fact sheets that Transpulse has put out on many issues, and if you look on the Transpulse website or on our website, you can find them. If that's the kind of study I think we need to do again, but for the LGB, so for around sexual and Risk and resilience did not cover it? Risk and resilience. The, the bisexual study? Oh. Um, I, I, it was long, I filled it out. You did I it, can't, okay. I can't I think, remember. I think we have no space for that information. There were some questions on this. It's mental health. Oh, it was all mental health. Yeah, That's it's right. just Not mental, mental health. health. That's right. Yeah, whereas I don't, they probably didn't ask about physical health things or about things like, well, maybe it did actually. Experiences with the emergency. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Only something very small, but yeah, yeah. there were a lot of questions.
questions on this. Yeah. I think we definitely need, I mean, it would be so great to get baseline data at some point. Um, and I think as much as um, the study that you're talking about was uh, project affirmation, talk mostly about people's experiences with healthcare providers and social service providers. Didn't ask as much about people's actual health conditions. And I think it would be fantastic if we could ask more about that. One way to get that research on, uh, especially the, the sexual health treatment and care, would be to study the whole population, not just GLB, and, and see if we have resources for surveys of the whole population. Because there are many people who kind of drift into being bisexual, and I, the, the, the straight population isn't getting the greatest yeah. sexual health education and care either. So there may be some funding opportunity for that strategy. Has anyone here heard of the Ontario Health Study, which is a fairly new so study that does it? They started out without questions, without very many questions about lesbian, gay, bio, trans, that, that would allow lesbian, gay, bio, trans people to identify themselves and then talk about their health issues. And so over the, over the last couple of years, we were able to pull together a small group of researchers um, to work with them. We said to them, hey, wait a minute, you know, you, this is not good. And they actually had incorporated a number of the questions that we suggested into the study. So they have some, for some period of time, they didn't have the question, so it won't have ca captured that. But it's a very big study, and it's going on for a really long time. So if anybody, if any of you do end up being invited or seeing it, Ontario Health Study, it is a broad-based study, exactly what you're talking about. And now it does have questions. So we can identify that, the people with us. That we can, yeah, so we can identify ourselves, and it then has the right, what they call skip patterns, inside the survey so that it will ask you the right questions based on how you've identified yourself. Um, Where though, they want you to have all of your medications handy when you do the study. Yeah, they, they want, want to write an application number of all your prescriptions. <laughs> yes, it's quite, it's quite. Heck, I knew it when I started. <laughs> yeah. But that could reveal some really useful stuff. As long as the sample's big enough to find the queer people in the sample, that yeah. could be really good. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? I just a, a question about some of the resources that are out there. I'm like, I identify as queer, and I'm a fairly knowledgeable person, but I don't know what the issues are that affect the queer population health-wise, other than you know some tweaking of um, you know safe sex and the HIV stuff. You know, like. I hear that we're at higher risk for some cancers, I have no idea which ones. I hear that we're at higher risk for other things, I have no idea what. And I'm wondering if there's um, maybe a tool that's been made or could be made that would be readily available on the website where you could print it out, take it to your doctor and say, I think I'm at higher risk for these things, should we screen for any of them? Yeah, I, I, I think um, that's so true that hardly anybody knows what, the, what, the, what they call the health disparities, what the risk things are. And some of them are obviously linked to not just our identities but other things about you know how we live our lives or experiences we've had and so on. Um, but there are a few there are a few pamphlets. I'll just see if I can find one. Okay, so there's that one. That's on the website. That's called Let's Talk About Health and that's a series of four. And it talks inside about um, what are some of the areas where we have slightly different experiences or, or different levels of, of uh, certain problems. So it does have in here heart health, alcohol and drug use, partner abuse, tobacco and smoking, cancer, emotional and mental health, nutritional fitness and weight, and sexual health. So all of those topics would be in the, in the text, would be things where there's something that we need to think about. Doesn't mean we're all at risk for all of them, but if you read about it, you would have a you know, a bit of a sense of what might be the things. And it's in pink too, which is nice. <laughs>